Is that your first line? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. I'll just let me just talk. No, you don't. All right. Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to Nashville. We're going to get started with this session. Uh, we're going to try and highlight some of the uh, challenges of treating patients with NTM pulmonary disease. And we have uh, two great speakers with me, Dr. David Griffith and Dr. Ashwin Basavaraj. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. David Griffith. Uh, he really doesn't need any introduction, uh, but for those of you who might not have met him yet, he is internationally renowned for his work in bronchiectasis and NTM lung disease. Uh, David is professor of medicine at National Jewish Health, and uh, I have learned so much from him over the years. David, thank you very much for giving the first talk on challenging care for NTM mycobacterial patients. Come on up. All right. Let's see. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I've only been here a couple of days, but this is the first venue I've been to without a bachelorette party. So I'm <laughs> really, really happy to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, some hot topic articles uh, published in, in Chest. My uh, potential uh, conflict of interest is I am a consultant and research grant recipient from InSmid Incorporated. So we'll review some evidence from uh, the not topic articles, sorry, little typo there, hot topic articles published in CHEST. And I want to talk for a minute too about the impact of CHEST on uh, mycobacterial disease publications. So first, um, oh gosh, it's been a couple years. Um, I was asked to uh, participate in the infectious disease what do, you, what do you call it? Uh, uh, the, it? I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, the in the I'm tr in the organization chart for chest. Where is Stefano? He's uh, an associate editor. He's associate editor. Yeah. Yeah. For infectious chest diseases. In chest infections. Yeah. So Stefano asked me to be one of his minions, and I said okay. So we got uh, there, and um, I had just done the uh, manuscript with Tim Maximit on managing MAC disease. And so uh, Stefano seemed like a sympathetic soul, so we discussed the possibility of doing an NTM series. Uh, and he and uh, Peter Mazzone uh, okayed it. And so we've had four uh, or three major publications. We've got two more in the pipeline. One is from Ted Maris uh, from Canada, which is going to discuss NTM pathogens other than MAC and abscesses. And just a quick word about that. Um, Christoph Long from uh, Germany has just published a, uh, also a series about NTM pathogens other than abscesses and MAC uh, in the uh, Lancet Respiratory Medicine. But these two are going to be different. The one that Christoph just published focuses only on treatment. And it was with the uh, uh, committee that put together the most recent guidelines. But the one from Ted is going to be uh, much more inclusive, talk about clinical presentations, prognosis, and, and that sort of thing. So it, Ted was actually on the committee that put together the uh, article for Christoph, so he, he knows to make it uh, different. But I'm very proud of that series, and I, I hope, you know, it's probably for a lot of you it may be too simple, but for people that you, uh, that you mentor, uh, I think it does have value. We use it for the fellows that come through National Jewish Health. Sorry, I, I don't know how I did that. Okay, let me try again. So I'm going to run through some of the highlights of NTM articles that have been published in CHEST over the, about the last three years. Um, this first one was Outcomes of Amicase and liposome, liposome Inhalation Suspension for Mycobacterium Obsessus. This was from uh, Jakob, Ingen, Jakob von Ingen's group from the Netherlands. And of course, this is a very important topic. Everybody here I know is interested in does uh, Alice have activity against abscesses. And of course, it's not FDA approved for that indication. So 
Uh, what, what Yako and his colleagues did was they put together uh, a number of physicians in five countries who were taking care of abscessus patients. Uh, interestingly, 15% um, of them were amicacin resistant, and, uh, but only about 56% were macrolide resistant. That was very odd. I, there's not great microbiology that accompanies this paper. <clears throat> you can see they were started on Alice because of amicacin toxicity um, and refractory disease. Uh, but what's interesting about it is there's a great graph in it that shows every patient's individual therapy. So guess what? 41 patients, 41 regimens. Uh, there, literally, there are no two that are alike, which of course is a huge weakness uh, of the study. But uh, culture conversion was attained in 43% uh, of their patients. Uh, and the other thing that I found very interesting was that 66 of the patients, 66% had adverse events, but what's not on there? Hoarseness. I don't, I, I've asked Yako about that. Uh, I, I have no clue uh, how they came up with the, the numbers that they have. At any rate, um, very provocative paper. I can tell you that uh, Kevin Winthrop uh, and his folks in Oregon and uh, myself uh, at National Jewish, we also have a series of patients that we've treated uh, with abscesses with Alice, and uh, that paper is now under review, guess where? Chest. So I won't, uh, I, I don't think my co-investigators would be crazy about me uh, giving the data from that right now, but there is a second one which also shows promising microbiologic results. Um, this is a paper uh, that looked at uh, inhaled generic amicacin uh, for mycobacterium abscessus disease. Uh, what's important here is that 56% of, pa 56 of these patients had subspecies Massilians, 44% with abscessus. Um, and uh, patients were treated aggressively and uniformly, which is a plus. Uh, clofazamine was kind of the wild card. It was introduced uh, for some patients and not for others. But uh, what's interesting is that uh, cure or microbiologic cure was achieved in 91% of the patients with subspecies Massilians and 31% with subspecies abscessus. So you might say, well, Dave, doesn't that tell you that inhaled generic amicacin is the, is the way to go? Unfortunately not. The numbers that they have for microbiologic cure are exactly what you get when you split Massilians and abscessus patients. So you go to the literature and the Massilians group in any study is gonna have 85, 90% microbiologic cure, and the abscessus abscessus is gonna have 30%. So these guys have mostly just reproduced the dichotomy between mesilience and abscessus. Um, now this was a study uh, from the uh, uh, error case uh, trials, the convert studies. Um, this was looking at what was described as sustainability and durability of uh, microbiologic conversion. Sustainability was in the 12 months after somebody converted, did their sputum remain negative? And the durability part is after you stop the medicine, did their sputum remain negative? And uh, as you can see, uh, of patients who achieved culture conversion by month six, 54% uh, of the folks who got Alice were sustainably and durably converted, and no patients who had converted on the background therapy by itself had sustainable or durable conversions. Um, the relapse rates weren't, were not zero, but 9% in Alice and 30% in the uh, background therapy. I think this is a little, this is an aspect of the era case studies. You know, there have been a series of them that is underappreciated. And it's not one I think that anybody uh, is going to uh, stand up on a soapbox uh, to talk about, but this idea of remaining negative 
after discontinuation of therapy is a big deal. As everybody knows, uh, a lot of these folks have microbiologic occurrences. So at least in this first blush, it looks like adding Alice to a treatment regimen is going to decrease your chances of having microbiologic occurrence. Now, uh, getting back to the dark side here, this was uh, a publication uh, describing uh, ulcerative laryngitis uh, in a uh, patient who was on Aracase. Uh, after five ALICE treatments, this patient had hoarseness and difficulty speaking, and after nine treatments, she discontinued ALICE because of the symptoms. Um, they found on visualization of the vocal cords, hyperemia of the true vocal folds with plaque-like lesions that suggested mucosal sloughing and ulceration. Um, at week six, the voice quality had returned to baseline, but she still had vocal fatigue, which persisted beyond there. Now, uh, a good friend and member of the audience, Dr. Swenson, uh, submitted a letter to the editor in response and pointed out that this patient had multiple risk factors for laryngeal disease, including particularly rheumatoid arthritis and GERD, which, by the way, is that risk is not necessarily mitigated by acid-reducing uh, medications. So um, what I find interesting about this is that uh, it, there's not been a wave of reports of ulcerative laryngitis uh, since this, this report. Now, what I think has to happen at some point is if 50% of the patients you give a drug to become hoarse, we need a, a large prospective trial with an otolaryngologist or to, to evaluate the vocal cords of these patients. And as I'm sure all of you who use, this, uh, use ALICE know, once you stop the drug, the hoarseness improves. And in most people, when you re-challenge, the hoarseness doesn't come back, which is a miracle in my opinion. That's the only way I can explain it. But nevertheless, we need a, a good, large, prospective study to settle this question. Um, now this is, uh, forgive me, I, this may be the most important study uh, in, this, in this group. Um, this is again from Dr. Van Ingen's group in uh, the Netherlands, looking at time to positivity of broth cultures in the midget system as a biomarker for treatment response in MAC pulmonary disease. So it was looking back at 49 patients, and actually quite a number of them with fibrocavitary disease, which is, just as an aside, is a big difference between our population and the, the one in the Netherlands. Um, and 69% uh, of these people converted their sputum. But what's interesting is, at baseline, a time to positivity of greater than seven days was associated with sputum conversion. A time to positivity of greater than 15 days after three months of treatment was even more strongly associated with sputum conversion at six months. So a six months time to positivity uh, greater than 15 days after three months of treatment was predictive of culture conversion within the first um, six months of treatment. So this is a big deal. I mean, people are looking all over the place for biomarkers to predict who's going to respond to therapy. And here, right under our nose, Looks like one that's, that's pretty good. Of course, it's not um, foolproof. But one thing that uh, Yako suggests about this, which I think is also very important, is maybe we can do drug trials at, for three months duration and then predict who is going to respond to a particular drug rather than doing what uh, INSMED had to do, which was a study that was two years, basically. Now, this is, um, uh, this is a, the only study that I've got that's not in chest, but I wanted to show it because it's in the same time frame, and I think it's equally important. Uh, this is from Ted Maris's group in Canada. Uh, it was looking at uh, 125 MAC patients who came in uh, treatment naive. A time to positivity, uh, time to positivity was associated with uh, progressive MAC disease, AFB smear positivity, and treatment initiation by three 
uh, in six months. A threshold time to positivity of 10 days or less was associated with uh, MAC disease, AFB smear positivity, and treatment by three and six months. So their conclusion was the time to positivity is associated with bacterial burden and infection severity and increases with response to treatment. So a threshold at 10 days uh, appears to be useful in predicting significant MAC disease. So can any of you get time to positivity on your cultures? No. Well, can, you can, Colin? Okay, well we can, or everybody can, I'm sorry. No, we can't do it yet at National Jewish. But it looks like it has real promise. I mean, the rest of the world is out looking for biomarkers in, the, in bronchovalvular lavage fluid. And again, as I say, maybe this is just sitting under our noses. Um, this was a study uh, looking at uh, the time between diagnosis and treatment for NTM disease on culture conversion and all-cause mortality. Now, what I'd like to point out here, so these were uh, 700 patients treated for six or more months. Now, it's kind of old. It was 97 to 2013. The median waiting period without an antibiotic was 4.8 months, which I don't know, that sounds a little short to me. Uh, however, you see the, the range was up to 21 months. 67% had culture conversion within six months. They found no association between the waiting period and six-month culture conversion or death. Uh, in a subgroup who were treated for more than 12 months, the 12-month culture conversion was associated with reduced rate of death. So this seems to uh, uh, not promote, but at least uh, allow the idea of watchful waiting uh, in your patients. So these guys, if they were watchfully waited, didn't seem to have an impact on their culture conversion or, or, or death, but uh, there was a survival benefit by achieving culture conversion uh, for patients who needed treatment. So I don't know that this sheds a lot of light on the, the controversy that we have in uh, deciding who to watch and, and who to start medicine on. We still don't have a great answer for that. But it does tell you that this is generally an indolent process. And I think most of us appreciate that and are not quick to pull the trigger on medicine. We just don't want to be too late. So you can't give a talk uh, about mycobacterial disease without proteomics. Um, this is from uh, James Chalmers' group. And I'll just sort of cut to the chase on this one. Uh, they had CF patients, bronchiectasis patients, and COPD patients, and then in patients in all three groups infected by NTM. Um, there was no statistically significant association uh, in sputum protein profiles between patients infected in any of the group and not infected. Not too surprising, I guess. Uh, I mean, this is still uh, a science, I think, uh, in its infancy. Now, there was an accompanying um, editorial by our friend Stefano. And these are some of the problems that he found uh, with the, the study. Um, but, you know, there's promise in this work. This work has to be done. This is the basis of how we're going to evaluate uh, proteomics going forward. But at least for right now, bottom line, uh, there's, this, there's not a biomarker here that tells you when these patients have NTM disease and when they don't. Um, now switching gears just a little bit. Oh, I, I, I'm gonna lay off this one. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. You don't mind if I give your talk, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Just keep going, baby. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, the only thing I want to point out is that uh, 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 Ashwin is first author on this paper, so I imagine he is going to say something about it. But there is an uh, editorial that goes along with this from John Chalmers. And 
what I think is interesting about this, and I know Ashwin will, and uh, I just wanna ask the question while I'm standing here. So when somebody comes to National Jewish, if they open their mouth, they breathe salt water. We do it for everybody, including visitors. Nobody gets out of there without <laughs> airway clearance. Are we doing the right thing, Ash? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, another big topic uh, in the world of bronchiectasis uh, are uh, uh, tools for patient reported outcomes. And uh, this COPD assessment test, or CAT, looks very promising. And so um, I guess I would ask my colleagues also what they think about th uh, this particular tool uh, for uh, assessing management of patients with bronchiectasis, but it looks pretty good. There was also, uh, from our good friends P.J. McShane and Tim Axmet, uh, a nice editorial that went along with it, um, that as it, it looks like this demonstrates great repeatability, uh, the uh, CAT score, um, the, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry for the typo, it correlates well with other PRO measures, uh, in the UK and Spain. A high CAT score is suggestive of more severe disease. Higher CAT scores predicted frequent exacerbations. Um, and between two studies that were published in CHEST, I put up the one from England, but there was one from Spain as well. There is good correlation. So just uh, this is a list of some of the manuscripts in the last three years related to bronchiectasis. Um, uh, uh, you might want to comment on the, the one in, from the First Nations children, no? Okay, <laughs> take it back. <laughs> so the, uh, the one that you might find interesting is about cardiovascular events. Uh, they're actually rather frequent and the death rate is pretty high, but they seem to correlate more with underlying uh, or other comorbidities rather than bronchiectasis, but nevertheless, uh, mortality from cardiovascular events is surprisingly high after COPD exacerbations. So I wanted to just put in a plug for chest uh, while I've got the, got the platform. In my career, the, I've submitted quite a number of manuscripts uh, to chest, and there have been two that I thought were particularly important um, that chest was very accommodating. And the first was, Back 2013-14, when bedaquilin was first introduced for treatment of tuberculosis, and I don't know if you guys remember, but there was in one of the original papers a, ver a table listing MICs for uh, NTM, and the NTM MICs are phenomenally low. So we thought we had the key to the highway. Just get this bedaquilin going and, and we're gonna cure everybody. Well. The other side of it, as you may also recall, was in the initial TB study looking at bedaquilin, there were excess deaths associated with taking bedaquilin. So we were kind of, we thought, skating on thin ice, but what the heck, we went ahead and we started giving bedaquilin to some of our MAC patients, which by the way, with very extensive uh, um, uh, uh, information about the uh, potential side effects, which by the way, didn't turn out there, there, there is no excess cardiac mortality with bedaquilin that I've seen. At any rate, uh, I can remember being at CHEST some years ago back around here and chasing down the editor of CHEST to tell him about the data. And I said, will you guys look at this in an expedited manner? And he said, yes, and they did. And I, it would probably still be in review if we hadn't done that. Now, bedaquilin has turned out to be an underachiever, which is too bad but it's a safe underachiever. And then this was uh, sort of my colleague Richard Wallace's career, uh, piece de resistance. This cohort of patients that we treated uh, for MAC, we had a little bit of kerfuffle with another journal and we submitted it to CHEST and it was uh, accepted and is now part of the MAC canon in the, uh, in the United States. So I'm very grateful to the uh, editors at CHESS. They have done me a favor more than once. So I want to just close with the, am I over? Yeah, that's okay. Uh, okay. 
I'll talk faster. <laughs> so we all worry about the impact factor of the journal we submit our papers to. And I don't know if anybody knows how you calculate an impact factor, but it's like looking in a telescope at the distant galaxies. So what happens basically is they take two years of publications prior to the year you're in, and they look at were, were, pub, were manuscripts in your, in your journal cited in other manuscripts. So for instance, if a journal has an impact factor of three in 2008, then it's papers published in 2006 and 2007 receiving three citations each on average in 2008. Simple. Okay. So the actual formula is right below that if anybody wants to know. But I, I just want to point this out. It, impact factor is, is not an easy thing to come by. So here are some impact factors for pulmonary and respiratory medical journals. Um, you know, you can see the blue journals at 30, ERJ at 16, uh, thorax and chest are about, about the same. Lancet respiratory medicine is 102. Um, but here, oh, I, a picture of our two uh, associate editors, uh, Stefano and PJ. Uh, Stefano has just stepped down and PJ is taking it over. And the reason I'm showing their pictures is that we have a sympathetic audience at, at chest in the infectious disease uh, part of the journal. Uh, Stefano is big in bronchiectasis in Europe. Uh, everybody knows PJ in the United States. So um, what I would like to point, if we're going to get the impact factor of chest up, when you write a manuscript, cite chest articles, if you can. I mean, obviously, don't do something that's not ethical, but when you have the opportunity, uh, cite a chest article. Submit the good stuff, the, ICE, the RCTs. Your, your uh, colleagues are all going to be on your butt to go to Lancet Pulmonary Medicine. Well, you can waste time there, uh, you know, sending it back and so on. Look, uh, I don't think this is rocket science. And, and I, I have tried to do that with some of the manuscripts that we have. Also, write good reviews. Those things get a ton of citations. Offer to write a review on, on something. And um, don't fear the impact factor of competing journals. Everybody reads everything. Remember that. That the guy who reads Christoph's article in Lancet Pulmonary Medicine is going to read your article in chest because everybody gets the same list of articles to read. So that's my little plug for chest. And last, I want to give a little shout out to the girls from Staten Island. Uh, Doreen, congratulations on your presidency. I think that's great. And congratulations on the bronchiectasis review in the New England Journal. Is it in the water there in Staten Island? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm sorry, I'm over. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. We'll let you go over any time you want. We love to hear you talk and teach us. All right. We're going to move on to uh, uh, Dr. Basavaraj's talk. Uh, Ashwin is Section Chief of Pulmonary and Critical Care at our Bellevue Hospital. Uh, and he's Associate Director of our Bronchiectasis Program, and he's going to talk to us today a little bit about non-pharmacologic therapies in NTM lung disease. Thanks, Ashwin. All right. Thanks, Doreen. So these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, I work as a consultant and on the advisory board for a number of companies interested in bronchiectasis and also a principal investigator for one of our uh, airway clearance studies uh, involving Baxter here. So when we talk about non-pharmacologic -pharmac strategies for NTM, there's a number of um, you know, ways that we can tackle this, right? So you know, one of the strategies is reducing the risk of NTM exposure. We know that NTM is ubiquitous in the environment, um, you know, in stagnant water sources, um, you know, humidifiers, old shower heads, soil, and just educating our patients to be cognizant of these environmental risk factors um, could itself you know, reduce the risk of NTM for our patients. We want to manage comorbidities as well. Uh, we know that reflux, aspiration, dysphagia, you know, could potentially contribute to uh, bronchiectasis and NTM. 
Um, so that could be another non-pharmacologic strategy to try to reduce our you know, uh, progression for NTM. Smoking cessation, nutrition, um, you know, weight loss could be a marker for uh, progression of NTM. So we want to make sure um, that we're keeping on top of uh, you know, weight uh, and nutrition for our patients. Exercise and then airway clearance, which is you know, obviously going to be the bulk of this talk. So, uh, you know, when we talk about airway clearance, we, you know, it's, it's important to highlight you know, inflammation in the model for bronchiectasis with the vicious cycle hypothesis, um, highlighting bronchiectasis uh, leading to abnormal mucus clearance and uh, pooling of mucus into the dilated airways, bacterial colonization you know, with that mucus leading to neutroph neutrophilic inflammation and further destruction. And what airway clearance is trying to do is trying to break this vicious cycle with uh, relieving the mucus from these pooled airways and trying to reduce the inflammation there. The idea of this vicious cycle has uh, you know, recently morphed into this idea of the vicious vortex model, where a lot of these steps are interconnected and in that even if we try to stop one of these uh, you know, four steps, that um, you know, the progression of, of bronchiectasis still, still could happen. So the goals of airway clearance are to break the vicious cycle, reduce inflammation, we want to improve the symptoms of our patients, reduce exacerbations of bronchiectasis, and improve quality of life of our patients. And there's a number of modalities for airway clearance, and we can you know, divide it in a number of ways, but one of the ways that I like to divide it is you know, we have um, devices or instrumental techniques, so positive excitatory pressure devices, where patients are inhaling and exhaling through these devices to try to create vibrations in the airways to try to break up the mucus and clear out the, the mucus. Uh, we have high-frequency chest wall oscillation devices that, you know, we all know that shakes up the chest and tries to break up mucus that way. Um, we have physiotherapy techniques, postural drainage, autogenic drainage, and uh, active cycle breathing techniques that our chest physiotherapists can teach our patients, uh, which are all strategies to try to help with uh, mucus clearance. And with active cycle breathing techniques specifically, it involves a series of breathing control, long deep breaths, another cycle of breathing control, and then huff coughing after the end of these long deep breaths to try, to try to propel mucus out of their airways. And an adjunct to airway clearance are uh, mucoactive agents, and there's ways to categorize mucoactive agents, expectorants, mucoregulators, mucolytics, and mucokinetics, with the most common mucoactive agent that we often use clinically, uh, hypertonic saline as, a, as an expectorant here. And with hypertonic staling, the way it works, it could directly stimulate coughing, leading to increased weight of sputum that's expectorated, humidifying airways, enhancing ciliary function. There's been studies that, uh, you know, small studies that have shown that it's well tolerated in our bronchiectasis patients, and it can improve lung function and quality of life. Um, and the studies in terms of the exact concentration of saline is, is conflicting. There's been studies that say that the higher concentration of saline leads to improved outcomes, where other studies suggest that there's no difference uh, in the concentration of saline and that there's improved outcomes either way. So there's more studies that need to be done on the ideal concentration of saline that needs to be used. Pulmonary rehab and exercise is also an important non-pharmacologic strategy that by itself can help with mucociliary clearance. And some of the data suggests that there are short-term improvements in exercise capacity and quality of life um, with a number of uh, pulmonary rehab techniques and it may prolong our time to first exacerbation of uh, bronchiectasis exacerbations in our patients. So the data with airway clearance, um, a lot of it is small trials with a small amount of patients, but what's out there has shown you know, some clinical benefit with airway clearance. Um, and these are just uh, a few examples of some of the studies that are out there with improvement in exercise capacity and quality of life in patients that use an oscillatory device versus management without any sort of chest therapy, improvement of symptoms, pulmonary function, and reduction in inflammatory markers with high-frequency chest wall oscillation, and a reduction in sputum quantity in those that use an oscillatory PEP device uh, and autogenic drainage. Uh, and another study that was uh, a randomized placebo control study that was published a few years ago, um, looking at a, a technique that's often utilized in Europe um, with the uh, slow expiration with the glottis in the lateral position. Um, you know, patients here, about 20 patients were randomized to this strategy and 20 patients were randomized to placebo exercise techniques with this particular study founding that the intervention group um, had higher sputum volume that was expectorated, fewer exacerbations, improved quality of life, and improved cough based on the Lycaster cough questionnaire. Now, we did a small uh, retrospective study uh, at our institution looking at airway clearance and NTM lung disease. So this was a retrospective study um, looking at NTM patients that did not receive antibiotics for NTM 
Half of these patients receive chest physiotherapy at baseline with half of the, the other half of patients just receiving usual care for bronchiectasis. And we found that you know, in patients that received chest physiotherapy, they had improvement in their symptoms, improvement in cough at six months, nine months, 12 months, and two years without any sort of antibiotic use in our NTM patients, suggesting that you know, airway clearance by itself could, you know, could help our patients uh, symptomatically uh, in, you know, in a select amount of uh, select patients. So, you know, there's been systematic reviews looking at it, uh, looking at airway clearance techniques. This was a Cochrane database uh, review that was published years ago, but, you know, concluded that airway clearance techniques are safe for individuals with stable bronchiectasis. Um, there's improvement in sputum expectoration, lung function, and quality of life with our patients. We don't know the exact role in the acute exacerbation phase of bronchiectasis, and obviously more data is needed to establish, you know, airway clearance techniques and effects on patient outcomes and differences between various airway clearance techniques. Uh, and this was a more recent systematic review actually looking at airway clearance techniques in the acute exacerbation uh, state, which found that um, in six studies, uh, all, all studies uh, found that airway clearance techniques appear to be safe in patients in the acute exacerbation phase of bronchiectasis, which clinically makes sense. We often continue our airway clearance techniques or even start airway clearance during the acute exacerbation phase when patients are hospitalized. So this was a study that we looked at uh, utilizing uh, the United States Bronchiectasis and NTM Research Registry, which is a consortium of about 20 centers of excellence of bronchiectasis across the United States, and we want to delve in a little bit more about airway clearance in the registry. And what we found here uh, was that um, in patients uh, that utilized airway clearance techniques, the, the population appeared to just be a sicker cohort. They had higher rates of pseudomonas, higher rates of bronchiectasis exacerbations, and higher hospitalizations for pulmonary illness in the prior years of, of utilizing their airway clearance, which to us tells us that they're probably trying to utilize their airway clearance to improve symptomatically the way that they're feeling. Um, they also found, we also found that there was a greater odds of experiencing exacerbation while they utilize their airway clearance. Again, highlighting that this is a sick population that utilizes airway clearance. It's not airway clearance alone that's gonna help these patients that are other factors that are needed uh, in treatment that's needed to help uh, you know, patients during an exacerbation state. Um, and then finally here, we found that there was a high drop-off rate in airway clearance. About you know, over 50% of patients who utilize airway clearance at their baseline visit did not utilize airway clearance at their follow-up visit. Either you know, they did not perceive a benefit or they felt better and they stopped utilizing their airway clearance. There could be a number of factors on why they stopped it. So there was a study earlier this year that just looked at this particular point, why adherence for airway clearance is poor in bronchiectasis. Uh, there's a number of conclusions that they made. Um, could be a lack of time and motivation for our patients. They you know, have a lot of uh, medications and, and visits, clinical visits that, take, that takes time. And you know, these airway clearance techniques could be recommended twice a day by, you know, in and of itself, could be time consuming for the patient. Uh, you know, lack of access to resources or a lack of perceived health benefit uh, on the patient's uh, you know, perspective. And how can we promote adherence uh, you know, for airway clearance, um, you know, trialing different airway clearance techniques for patients um, you know, and trying to figure out what works for them. Um, you know, uh, reviewing airway clearance and education from chest physiotherapists regularly and having good social, so, social support, you know, having uh, family members you know, constantly reinforce the importance of airway clearance uh, you know, for, for our patients. So what do the guidelines say about bronchiectasis and airway clearance techniques? This is from the European Respiratory, Respiratory Society. Um, and what they're recommending in their guidelines is, you know, patients, uh, you know, who have a chronic productive cough um, or difficulty expectorating sputum, they should be taught an airway clearance technique by a trained physiotherapist, and they should perform this once or twice daily. Uh, and that those patients with bronchiectasis who have impaired exercise capacity should participate in a pulmonary rehab program and regular exercise. And patients who fail standard airway clearance techniques also should be started on mucoactive agents in these guidelines. So from my standpoint, what's the next step for airway clearance research? How can we improve uh, further studies? Um, we can look at, uh, based on study design and endpoints, looking at uh, larger trials, multi-centered, comparing different airway clearance techniques to try to figure out which technique may be more optimal compared to another technique. Looking at uh, effects of airway clearance on the microbiome, inflammation, pulmonary function, and trying to really identify valid endpoints. A lot of these uh, studies that we talked about looked at endpoints such as sputum volume and the weight um, of sputum that's expectorated, but is that really the endpoint that we should be looking at, or should we be thinking about other endpoints? For example, is there improvement 
um, in high-res CTs in patients that utilize airway clearance or improvement in inflammatory mediators. We also want to identify the ideal frequency of use um, and, you know, uh, potentially, you know, for example, hypertonic saline, what's the ideal concentration that should be used. And then we want to focus on patient adherence and support. We want to maximize adherence, improve access to chest physiotherapy, uh, and perform outreach to our providers just to educate our providers on airway clearance techniques. Now, there are some ongoing, a number of ongoing clinical trials in airway clearance. One of the large ones is the CLEAR trial looking at hypertonic saline and carbocysteine and looking at, you know, the number of exacerbations uh, over 52 weeks, the number of uh, other ongoing studies, uh, including high-frequency chest wall oscillation, which we're, we are a site of uh, for that particular study as well. So these are some uh, resources um, that we uh, instruct our patients to, um, to, to visit that are helpful. This is from the Australian group, um, the Bronc Exorcist Toolbox, which has some nice helpful videos on instructions, uh, um, video uh, instructions for patients that they can utilize airway clearance at home, and the impact website on the right, on the right um, that also has some good videos on, on airway clearance instructions that patients can utilize at home. So in summary, we know that airway clearance is a, an important management strategy in patients with bronchiectasis and NTM. There's a number of techniques that could be utilized in airway clearance. We want to focus on patient adherence and try to optimize that. And obviously, uh, you know, further high quality research is needed in this area. This is our team, uh, our bronchiectasis team at, at NYU, our director, Dr. Adriza Harris, our co-director, Dr. Kamahar. Leo Segal is involved in a number of our microbiome studies in bronchiectasis. Dr. Lau uh, overseeing our clinical trials and our nurse practitioner, Amy, that's really putting it all together for our patients here. And then um, finally here, we, uh, the World Bronchiectasis and NTM Conference um, is, uh, you know, occurs once or twice a year. Uh, last year it was in Prague and uh, this upcoming July is gonna be in the United States. Um, and, uh, is also going to be sponsored by our, our, our CME office at NYU. Um, we do have a booth out in the exhibit hall um, for those that want to uh, get more information on the conference. It's, it's really a nice conference that delves more into, in depth into bronchiectasis and NTM. And thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ashwin. You caught us up a little bit. That was phenomenal review. Us, us and uh, New Yorkers, we talk a little quicker than you from Tyler, Texas there, Dr. <laughs> uh, in any case, I've got 20 minutes to tell you everything you need to know about pharmacological treatment in NTM lung disease. Uh, so I'm going to try and highlight the most important things that you need to know. Obviously, we have a new guideline that came out in 2020. Uh, so I will be referring you to that. Uh, for lots of your management, and the slides should be coming up. Okay, so off we go. Uh, my COI slide, I am PI for a number of clinical research trials in bronchiectasis and NTM, but all of the funding goes to my institution. So we're gonna go through a patient case first. We've got a 55-year-old woman who presents with history of yearly chest infections since age 46. Uh, which were associated with small amounts of hemoptysis. So it took, nine, it took nine years for her to get diagnosed with bronchiectasis and NTM. So that's one of the major obstacles that we're all dealing with. Um, it was not until that she was 54 or eight years that she was diagnosed. Her symptoms at that time were cough, daily yellow sputum, wheezing and dyspnea. She had uh, multiple sputums done with mycobacterium avium. Uh, Klebsiella and H. influenza, and her CT showed areas of cystic bronchiectasis and nodular disease uh, in multiple lobes, as you can see here. Um, we've got lots of, lots of nice cuts with some areas of you know, early uh, cavitary formation. So she was started on airway clearance because we follow what Ashwin tells us to do. Uh, with exercise, hypertonic saline, and she also ended, ended up getting oscillatory vest therapy. She was initially treated with daily azithromycin, ethambutol, and rifampin, and converted her sputums uh, in about 18 months. It took her quite a while. Her symptoms and CT scan had both significantly improved. We're going to talk about what you need to do when your patients don't convert. Um, this, this was a number of years ago that we were treating her, and we didn't have many of the drugs that we have nowadays. She relapsed, however, about two years later. 
Her new culture was sent for susceptibility testing, and she was both macrolide and uh, amicacin susceptible, but her CT scan had demonstrated progression and her cough and sputum re returned. She was restarted on the standard regimen, azithroethambutol and rifampin, but was also given intravenous amicacin with improvement in her symptoms and CT scan. And then she was transitioned to liposomal inhaled amicacin, initially three times a week, and then she could tolerate it five times a week, which she required because of the dysphonia weekends off. She required six months of treatment until sputums converted, and then was treated for one year, uh, having uh, negative sputum cultures. And she continues now to exercise and use her daily clearance regimen, and is monitored every three months with sputum analysis and uh, PFT and CT imaging every six months. So we'll come back to her to say that was a fairly smooth ride for me for most of my patients. But I'm going to come back to her to say, what if things happened along the way? How do we deal with managing these patients and getting them on therapies? So the current guidelines that are, came out in 2020 um, recommend treatment for the majority of patients who have NTM lung disease. And I'm not going to go over the, the criteria for diagnosing it, but your patients must have classic symptoms radiographic findings that are consistent with NTM lung disease, and sputum cultures that are positive or bronchoscopic culture. And we really like to get a lot of sputum cultures to really demonstrate that they are truly infected. Uh, so this, the, but I do want to point out that even in the, in, um, even though these two studies did show that there was progression in the majority, 62% in the first study and 58% in the second, there are patients that are going to spontaneously culture convert on their own without pharmacological treatment. So very important to get to know your patient, to watch them closely. If you aren't going to treat them, just make sure you're following them clinically. So decisions to treat, minimal symptoms, stable CAT scan. Sometimes you don't know if it's stable because you've only got one CT. Stable pulmonary functions, less virulent species lower burden of disease, and if they have minimal comorbidities. Reasons to treat right away are going to be significant symptoms, progression of cavitary CT scan or cavitary disease, declining PFTs, more virulent species such as some of the rapid growers like M. abscessus and macrolide-resistant MAC, certainly, and smear-positive disease, <coughs> as well as comorbidities such as low BMI, immunosuppression, underlying lung disease, and malnutrition. I thank Dr. Daly for this slide, which shows the Mycobacterium avium complex species. Uh, we, uh, the most common species are Mycobacterium avium, intracellularia, and chimera, but there are many that are within that. Most of our labs do not subspeciate them to this level. And so the new guidelines in 2020 recommend antimicrobial susceptibility testing on patients with MAC lung disease. And the two drugs that you're going to be wanting to concentrate on are macrolides and amicacin. There's good correlation between in vitro and in vivo sensitivities. And you're going to see the cutoff points for clarithromycin, which is used for macrolides, and IV and liposomal in inhaled amicacin are slightly different with uh, lower, um, higher MIC cutoff points for uh, liposomal inhaled. So you're going to want to make sure you get that at the beginning, and then if your patients are persistently positive, they may have had a reinfection, uh, you'll want to retest their sensitivities down the road. So for nodular bronchiectasis, which is a, shown here on this CT in the right middle lobe and lingula, the standard therapy now is azithromycin's recommended uh, above, over clarithromycin with ethambutol, 25 milligrams per kilogram, and rifampin is recommended. And nodular disease can be nicely treated with three times a week therapy, as most of you probably know. And your duration is going to be 12 months after culture conversion. So that means you need to be monitoring sputum cultures for AFB quite frequently so you know when the patient has sputum converted. So we usually do it every one to two months. And here's a case of cavitary MAC disease. And we're going to usually start these patients on daily therapy. The doses change a little bit, um, but we're also often going to use intravenous amicacin for the first several months. And we usually use 15 milligrams per kilogram three times per week, um, and we'll monitor trough and peak levels. So let's go back to our patient case and say, what if? Well, we started her in azithromycin, ethambulin, and rifampin, and that's what's recommended in the guidelines. 
What if she develops significant nausea and a rash? Well, that happens more commonly than not. So we like to start our patients on therapy um, um, serially. We'll do one week with usually starting with ethambutol. I find that's best tolerated. Then we'll add the azithromycin, and third week we'll add the rifampin. So if there's going to be a rash that starts suddenly, we'll usually know, and we usually can then tease apart which drug might be causing the nausea or the or the uh, other GI upsets. The other thing that we'll want to do is, um, if there is significant nausea, some tricks you can do is to try and give meds uh, before bedtime. Sometimes they'll sleep through the nausea and certainly can use antiemetics, but then be careful about QT prolongation because they often, along with azithro, can cause QT prolongation. Well, she converted her sputums by six months, so we wouldn't put her in the refractory group of patients. But if it took her longer than six months, well, then we're dealing with re refractory mycobacterial um, avium lung disease, and we're going to talk about some of the studies that are out there to look at what do we do in those patients. We should be changing therapy at six months if they're still positive or adding drugs to the regimen. And then in this patient, we were lucky enough that she's been doing very well post-treatment uh, her second time. What if she starts complaining of intermittent uh, small volume hemoptysis and her CT starts to show thickening of the cavitary walls, but her smears and cultures are still negative for AFB? Start thinking about other pathogens, whether it's bacterial um, um, uh, infection or more commonly aspergillus. Uh, affecting these cavities, uh, make sure your uh, differential diagnosis is, is large. So what are some of the alternative drugs for treatment? If you can't get a patient on azithro, sometimes they tolerate clarithromycin. So you may not have to go to a new agent. But uh, clofazamine is available. Uh, it does require an IND, um, 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 but many centers are able to use it. We have a multiple IND through Novartis. Um, at our center. It does cause QT prolongation. It also causes skin tanning in about two-thirds of the patients, but overall fairly well tolerated. Bedaquilin, as was mentioned by Dr. Griffith, um, is fairly well tolerated. It's approved for MDRTB, so we're going to use it off-label. Um, and then uh, linezolid or tadezolid, the oxalinonones are available, uh, and there's some efficacy. You need to monitor your CBC closely because they're going to be on these for long periods of time, and you can also get neurologic toxicity. And then if we can't uh, get ALICE, if it's not approved in refractory, FDA, it's approved uh, by the FDA for refractory MAC, but if you want to start it earlier than that as their third drug, uh, it is um, often difficult to get through insurance, so we sometimes use inhaled amicacin, the parenteral formulation. And then there's lots of investigation going on dual beta-lactam testing for patients that might have macrolide-resistant disease. And so here uh, we talk about uh, what the refractory pulmonary patient, there are multiple retrospective studies. Uh, most of us recommend changing your patient from intermittent to daily first and then usually adding on inhaled liposomal amicacin. It's the only randomized trial. The CONVERT trial showed us that they, you would uh, get a 30% um, conversion compared to 9% if you left your patients on guideline-based therapy. And then you certainly could add clofazamine or bedaquilin if your patients cannot uh, use inhaled liposomal amicacin. We have to deal with this, uh, relapse versus reinfection. 50% of patients will have uh, cultures that become positive within two years after stopping therapy. And this lovely study that uh, Dr. Griffith put up there from 2014 at Tyler, Texas, uh, is the first one. Uh, there's also a study there from Northwestern where PJ McShane was, and then one from Korea. You can see microbiologic recurrence is anywhere from 25 to 50% in these studies. And the interesting thing is that so in two of the studies, three quarters of the patients were new infections. So think about the environment that your patient is living in. Treatment outcomes for MAC and M abscesses. Um, well, non-cavitary, uh, up to 80% conversion. I think that's high. Uh, yeah, um, 
but uh, there were some studies at, at, at 80 percent. Cavitary, you're not going to be as good, so 50 to 80 percent. And then once you've got resistant macrolide disease, you need prolonged aminoglycosides intravenously and often surgery to cure those. Those patients have a significantly higher mortality. And then for amobsessus, it depends on the species, and we're going to get to that. Um, whether or not you have an ERM gene and whether or not you're sensitive to macrolides really makes a difference in your ability to culture convert those patients. I love this uh, uh, white paper by Dr. Griffith, Mycobacterium obsessus. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guessed my name. So very important when you're looking at M, M obsessus that you are sure to differentiate whether you have M obsessus obsessus, M obsessus Belletii or M. abscessus mycilliense. Mycilliense is the good one. It doesn't have a functional ERM gene, so it's usually macrolide sensitive. Now many of the labs will do um, prolonged in in incubation. They don't have to give you this level of subspeciation, but as long as they're doing 14-day incubation for macrolides, you'll know if you have inducible resistance or not. So important to check with your lab whether you're getting a 3-day or a 14-day um, sensitivity test. And here I point out that the macrolides and amicacin are important for M. abscessus. And the in vitro drug susceptibility testing comes from many trials out there looking at many of these agents that were tried for M. abscessus, many of them very variable. I will, I'm going to bring up the guidelines to show you what the recommendations are right now. So if you have someone that's in, not inducible, so they're susceptible to macrolides. Usually that's going to be your mycilliense. You can start with uh, initial phase therapy, uh, greater than three drugs. So usually we will do amikacin, imipenem, and ticocycline for the sick patient. If they can't tolerate imipenem, then usually cefoxetin is substituted. And we will give azithromycin, because that's going to be an active drug in, in these patients. Um, and then we will transition them to azithro, linazolid, or enclofazamine. Uh, we will also use um, ALICE in many of these patients for their transition phase, although that is um, not um, FDA approved for, for M. abscessus. Uh, and then um, the continuation phase, as you can see, azithromycin, linazolid, clofazamine, inhaled amicacin is what's recommended in the guideline. And we will usually use at least three drugs in the continuation phase. For resistant patients, it's going to be more difficult because the azithro is no longer active in that group. So we only use it if the patients are frequent exacerbators. Otherwise, we don't put azithromycin into our regimen. And again, uh, it's not listed here. It's not in the guidelines. But you can see alternative drugs at the bottom. Omatocycline is something I think that we're going to hear more about in oral form of tigacycline. It's much better tolerated, much less... Uh, uh, no, a much uh, lower um, GI profile as far as toxicity. So uh, if I can get it approved, I'll do amicacin, imipenem, and omatocycline, along with an oxalinone or clofazamine as my initial regimen. And then when patients, um, in all of these patients, you're going to consider adjuvant therapy uh, with surgery if that is something that they are amenable to based on their localization of their disease, um, even if um, there are cases where we will use debulking therapy if someone's got significant cavities, even if they have bronchiolitis elsewhere, we may decide to go with surgery for macrolide-resistant uh, MAC or for M. abscessus. Good to make sure that you have uh, an experienced surgeon doing these patients because they can often be quite complicated. And here's a nice case that we did this year had two cavities in her right lung, and here she is six months later, uh, still on treatment uh, pharmacologically, but uh, her cultures are all negative. So what's new in the treatment of NTM? Well, we've repurposed some of the antibiotics that we just mentioned, bedaquilin, clofazamine, the oxalinones. Uh, there are non-antimicrobials out there with a lot of uh, trials going on in inhaled nitric oxide, intravenous gallium, and recombinant interleukin-7. Hopefully, we'll have some data on that. And then some new antimicrobials, um, apromycin, there's a trial going on, epitroborol, and I have to get that one down better, uh, and inhaled clofazamine, a uh, form of clofazamine in an inhaled uh, nebulized form. So there, there are some options that hopefully will be coming down the road in the next year or two. 
And then I just wanted to touch one slide on bacteriophages. There was an uh, interesting article that came out this year, uh, Phage Therapy uh, of Mycobacterial Infections, Compassionate Use of Phages in 20 Patients with Drug-Resistant Mycobacterial Disease. Um, this was published in June of 2022. They had isolates from 200 patients, 55 had matches. This was primarily done um, at UC San Diego and University of Pittsburgh, where uh, Dr. Hatfield uh, runs that program and has probably uh, one of the biggest biobanks for um, phages. 20 patients were enrolled. Most had M. abscessus species uh, that were included. Their antimicrobial regimens had to be continued while they were on the phage therapy. Phages were administered intravenously for the majority, twice daily. Uh, there were a few cases that were also nebulized or transitioned to nebulization. No adverse events were noted, um, which was uh, really quite reassuring. 11 of the 20 had either clinical or microbiologic responses. And they looked for neutralizing antibodies, particularly in the group that didn't respond. Uh, and they found only of the eight that, didn't, um, that had neutralizing antibodies, they felt they were not significant in four of those eight, so didn't seem to uh, be associated with not uh, with them. Um, causing a, a, a patient not to, um, not to improve. And then a single phage was used in 11, uh, and in those cases they then relooked was the phage, where they, was the patient resistant to that phage, and no resistance to, developed. So I think we will hear more about this down the road. It's certainly something to consider in patients, uh, the cases that you hear are often, often CF patients going on for transplant, um, but the question is, you know, can, be, can we be using it in non-CF uh, bronchiectatic patients with very progressive disease? So in summary, new guidelines suggest treatment for most patients need to decide who you can watch closely. You need antimicrobial susceptibility testing for NTM lung disease, three times a week treatment for MAC nodular disease, daily therapy for MAC cavitary disease, usually with IV amikacin, Alice therapy added to patients with recalcitrant disease, need subspeciation or ERM gene analysis for M. abscessus, know your lab, need 14-day incubation for your sensitivity tests. Um, surgery should be considered as an adjuvant in those with cavitary disease, macrolide-resistant disease, um, and macrolide-resistant M. abscessus. And please enroll your patients into clinical trials when appropriate. And I think uh, this is just a bit of Dorina Drizzo Harris' uh, opinion. Uh, treat, success of your treatment regimens are going to depend on the education and close communication that you have with your patient and with the patient has with your healthcare team. That really does add uh, a large amount of success to your uh, pharmacological treatment. Uh, here is our, our whole team. Uh, we do work with lots of people outside of pulmonary um, that help us in GI, in uh, pulmonary rehab, um, in ENT. Uh, it's, a, it's really a multidisciplinary disease, um, and we're very lucky to have some great people working with us. So thank you very much, and I hope to see you all in New York City for the World Bronchiectasis Conference in July, July 18th to the 20th. Thank you very much. So I'm going to take the liberty to have three or four minutes of questions for any of the panel members. I know we're beyond the time, so if you have to leave, um, feel free to. But um, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amazing, amazing uh, session. I'm Dr. Khilnani. I'm from New Delhi, India. We have a lot of experience of treating tuberculosis, but very little with NTM because of limited facilities. And now we have started diagnosing it. So my question is about, like, I have a patient who is 50 years old, has got relapse of MAC, otherwise immunocompetent, has got cavitary disease. Now, question, questions are two. One is role of surgery, at what point of time, and what should be the outcome? And that is one. Second is about amikacin uh, aerosol therapy, for how long, and what should be the end point? Okay, so I'll, I think we'll take the surg surgery in an immunocompetent patient with MAC. Yeah. You're wondering when we need to do that? Cavitary disease. 
Right, with cavitary disease, if it's localized, we will want to try to give them therapy, make sure they can tolerate a, ther an, a, a regimen up front, usually with intravenous amikacin. We will try to um, uh, get their sputums to convert before they go. Sometimes that's not possible, but you want to make sure they're on an adequate regimen, and we will continue therapy after. We would like to see them to have 12 months of negative cultures. So sometimes that happens right away after therapy, but we would certainly continue them for a year after surgery on treatment. Usually, I usually do, and I can ask Dr. Griffith and Dr. Basavaraj, but usually six to 12 weeks of IV amikacin after surgery. We're fairly aggressive. Uh, and then we'll convert, transfer them to Alice or uh, an, another regimen. Um, is that what you use, David? How much do you do? Um, I'll let Dr. Griffith answer the question about Alice therapy. How long, David, should they be on Alice therapy? The post-surgical patient? No, he's talking about in general. In general. Uh, well, we, it, it becomes part of the regimen for the, the patient. So uh, if I put someone on Alice, they convert their sputum, we keep them on it for 12 months after their sputum conversion until they've completed therapy. So they will be staying on it. Usually you're putting them on when they're still positive. So they're going to be staying on it for at least 12 months of therapy, and it'll often take a few months for them to clear their cultures. Um, and of course, not everybody is going to clear. Those patients are already in a poor risk group, right? They're already recalcitrant. So there will be a, a percentage of those patients that won't clear their sputums, even with Alice therapy. And then the questions are, should you add more therapy? Should you go to IV amikacin? Really, you're going to have to patient by patient risk benefit in that group. And what do we, sorry, last part. What do we do when there's persistent positivity for two years, three years? You keep giving medications. So again, the patient is reasonably well, you know, well preserved. So what do we do? I think most of us who treat this in the room are going to look at the patient. If they've got mild disease, we weren't able to convert them, and their symptoms aren't that terrible, we will stop therapy and watch them, even with positive cultures, as long as you watch them. If you, but if you've improved their symptoms, and they're on therapy, and their cultures are still positive, sometimes what happens is once you stop the meds, their symptoms are going to come back. So two or three months later, you may have to start the meds again. But again, it's really, it's really balancing how severe their disease is, how bad their pulmonary functions, can you tolerate progression off of meds. Um, so I think we all have patients that have been on meds for quite a while because they're very on the borderline of a very severe disease. So is it right to use inhaled uh, aerosol amikacin without uh, giving it systematically? We don't give it in critical care. You know. So giving amikacin only by aerosol therapy and not giving uh, intravenously, is it okay in this scenario? In which scenario? In a patient with, say, MAC or abscesses. Uh, yes, I think most of us use it as needed, of course. And I mean, the Alice, Alice is obviously nebulized. But after we finish our IV therapy, if we're, they're on IV, we transition many of those patients to nebulized. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to let anyone else who has questions for the panel can come up and meet the speakers individually. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the meeting.